Your Excellencies, uh, allow me to extend a very warm welcome to the Horace's Extraordinary Meeting 2020 on the subject of the potentials of South Asia. I'm delighted to be chairing this session for the potentials of South Asia with Honorable Ministers from Shark Nation. I'm pleased with Horace's and with Dr. Frank Richter for continuously bringing South Asian dignitaries together and in creating this cohesive force in order to evaluate and reorient our regional values for economic integration. The platform like Shark was established 35 years ago with objective to promote the welfare of the people of South Asia. Today, time has brought us in a very strange stage Perspective on globalization has a complete new set of de definition in just about seven months of time. The outwardly approach of global trading and business approach has been challenged for innovation based on digital technology. Disaster has occurred. However, mankind have always endured such challenges and proven the resiliency and again, we are yet to break this chain and we have to look forward for the prosperity of the people and our civilization. Just here in South Asia, the magnitude of the adverse impact of the global pandemic on human health have been predicted as one of the worst in the world. Allow me to set in stage some of the important pointers to help you continue with our dialogue this morning, this afternoon. SHARC, South Asian Regional Association for Regional Cooperation was formed in Bangladesh in 1985. South Asia is the fastest growing region in the world. Despite extensive extent, existence of bilateral and multilateral free trading agreement, South Asia is one of the least economically integrated region in the world. Intra-regional trade in South Asia remains well below its potential at 5% of the region's global trade. In, compared, in comparison to the ASEAN region, where inter-regional trade marks up to 25%. Trade among South Asian countries currently total to just about 23 billion far below an estimation, estimated value of the 67 billion earlier. Regional cooperation has the potentials to produce significant gains across all countries of South Asia. International trade now stands at just one third of the potential with an estimated gap of 23 billion annually. An electricity market for the BBIN countries, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India and Nepal, would save an estimated 17 billion in capital cost and improvements in transport and logistics can reduce another 50% higher cost for container shipments in South Asia compared to the OECD nations. World Bank has already injected 6 billion for the eight countries post pandemic status. World Bank has projected an estimation of the regional growth to fall in the range between 1.8 to 2.8% in 2020. South Asia can benefit from the likely diversification of global supply chain, rapid digitalization of their economies, higher allocation of health sector and giving a boost to the pharmaceutical service sector, especially IT enabled once the new era of technology begins. As per the informal meeting, that took place recently of the finance ministers of the SARC on September the 16, 2020. They have vowed to work on bringing down tariff, eliminating non-tariff and para-tariff barrier, reduce sensitive list under SAFTA, energy cooperation, adopt trade facilitation, improve regional connectivity by railroad, air and sea, 
finalize SARC agreement on promotion and protection of investment and widen the scope of SARC agreement on avoidance of double taxation and mutual administrative assistance in tax matters and harmonize custom procedures and documentations to facilitate movement of goods across the region. The trade imbalance in the region of the importance is of importance to be resolved. India's trade with the eight countries has rose up to 36 billion. All countries in the yen eight has trade deficit with India. Bangladesh has a deficit of 7.6 billion, followed by Nepal, which is 6.8 billion. Trade has been limited by several factors such as in inadequate road, marine, air transport. Other constraints include protective tariffs, real and perceived non-tariff barriers, restrictions on investments and broad and, and broad trust deficit throughout the region, which is seen from time to time. People say that whatever has been accomplished in SARC is far short and far too late, particularly on the economic front. Now, with this backgrounder, I wish to introduce first our honored guest, uh, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh, Mr. Sair Alam, Alam, former State Minister of Foreign Affairs from 14 to 18. He was the Vice Chairman of All Party Parliament Group on Climate Change, Education and Poverty Reduction, played a key role in the enactment of the Right to Information Act, RTI 2009. And here goes my first question to our honored guest, Minister Alam. It has been over three decades of the establishment of SARC. If we compare with EU or even ASEAN, we have a very poor result in terms of progress. As a founder of Vice Chairman of the Shark Chamber of Commerce and Industry, that's me, as well as President of the Major Business Chambers in Nepal. I myself have put in a lot of effort on the regional cooperation. Regional growth and regional trade investment in the SARC region, region along with many leaders. Should forums like SAFTA, SASEPs or ISAS has a role to play in the SARC? Structured. Why do you perceive, how do you perceive the SARC forum as of now and especially at a contest of such global pandemic? How are these forums helping millions of MSME in, in the region? Do you think the mutual integration and programs in between the countries and such policies are going to benefit millions of entrepreneurs in the region? Why, if so, why we have not initiated these? And what could be a new perspective in the current context? Mr. Alam. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Minister Vinod Choudhury, uh, Chairman of CJ uh, Corp Global and uh, uh, Member of Parliament in Nepal. Uh, thank you for hosting this fantastic program. Uh, now I'd like to uh, recognize the presence and express my gratitude to my fellow colleagues and uh, our friends and dear brothers, uh, Minister of State for Road, Transport and uh, Highway, uh, Mr. V.K. Singh, a very close friend of Bangladesh uh, uh, from Government of India. Uh, uh, Brother uh, Abdullah Shahid, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Maldives, and Mr. Uh, Pradeep Kumar uh, Gawali, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Nepal. Uh, I express my gratitude uh, to the organizers today for giving me this opportunity to listen to the resource person and you know share this. Uh, and you you were absolutely direct in your questions and uh, at at interactory uh, level. Uh, I am also happy to represent the uh, South Asian region uh, sub region in front of this uh, August. Uh, uh, audience uh, and dwell on particularly our region's potential, as you rightly put out. Uh, every fourth person of this world is a South Asian. Uh, the region comprising eight countries accounting uh, accounts for 2% uh, of the global GDP, and only 2% of global GDP when fourth person is, is a South Asian. And 40% of the world's poorest, uh, like it or not, lives in this region. Uh, 
the region's economic outlook turned uh, further grim uh, when it's affected by the COVID-19. I'm coming to your uh, you know, question. Uh, and according to the World Bank estimate, GDP of the region is going to shrink by 2.7% uh, this year. Uh, because of this pandemic, uh, mitigation measures hinder consumption and services activity and uncertainty about the spill of this pandemic cuts down private investment. And uh, as a businessman and as a shamble leader, I'm sure you feel that uh, brunt of that uh, you know, that uh, COVID-19 impact. And, you know, I, I observe that very closely, not as, as a minister of state for foreign affairs, but because of my uh, immediate past background, uh, you know, uh, and if I'm thrown out of my current job, I'll have to go back to my uh, business. So, you know, I, I follow that very closely. Uh, strikingly, uh, as some of you might uh, already know, that uh, Bangladesh actually registered a growth of 5.2% uh, and our fiscal year fortunately probably ended uh, end of June. But, you know, that's pure just calendar time. But, you know, we are already in September and the next fiscal year is not looking as bright uh, uh, as uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, during half of the first phase of this, let's say, pandemic. And we are already experiencing a second uh, um, uh, in influx. Uh, the South Asian region attained consistent economic growth, you know, despite all the, the, uh, the negativity, I just, uh, the negative numbers and figures and statistics. Uh, uh, however, uh, fact remains that this region is still not as integrated as the uh, potential would suggest and you know this is something our leaders uh, realized uh, father of the nation Bangladesh Sheikh Mujibur Rahman in his maiden speech in Calcutta immediately after the war of liberation uh, and independence in 1972 uh, they you know talked about uh, a, a, a integrated South Asia uh, and then you know uh, the result and output of that was the launch of SARC in Bangladesh in 1985. Uh, trade and investment volume of almost all the SARC member states have multiplied many fold in the last few decades. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in terms of intra regional flow of goods and capital, a lot is still left to be expected. Our next generation of uh, activities and uh, initiatives, in fact, need to be directed towards elimination uh, barriers uh, standing in the way of people to people connectivity and greater regional connectivity. A lot, lot of work is being done. Uh, I'll come into that in a while. Uh, we must acknowledge the South Asia's uh, potentials to grow uh, are enormous. The journey is still bumpy. The region faces an uphill task of sustainable development, a significant component of which could best be addressed through a successful intermingling with the rest of the world. Uh, the South Asian leadership uh, took a lot of important decisions in the past, which need successful implementation. And that is, I think, where we lag behind. Uh, you know, if we compare our initiative, um, you know, compared to other regional initiatives. The regional countries successfully mobilized Corona Emergency Fund uh, to cite a very recent example, which lifted confidence of the SARC member states. Uh, established in 1985, the regional organization SARC leaves a lot, of, lot to expect in terms of integrating the region. The SARC Motor Vehicle Agreement was supposed to be signed during the 8th SARC Summit held in Kathmandu in November 2014. The, but, uh, you know, and uh, the Bangladesh... Uh, uh, but unfortunately, it couldn't be signed due to the opposition from one particular member state. Uh, the Bangladesh, Bhutan, uh, India, Nepal motor vehicle agreement was signed in June 2015 after we failed uh, at, uh, at the AGS of SARC, which is expected to promote safe and environmentally sound road transportation in the sub region. The people of the four countries will benefit through seamless movement of goods and passenger uh, across borders. Since 2014, South Asia. Uh, has been the fastest growing uh, sub region in the world uh, with its eight economies collectively boosting average annual growth of 7%. And that's phenomenal. That's fantastic. Uh, this is higher even than East Asia, uh, where the average is 6.2%, uh, which includes China, uh, South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia grew at the rate of 4.9%, and the Pacific grew at 4.7%. So we have done fantastically well in the in, you know, last, last uh, couple of years. Uh, it is our realization that to carry uh, on this impressive track record or build better and uh, you know, bigger and larger beyond the next couple of years will require further reforms um, and investment. Uh, strong growth in South Asia has been largely driven by the performance of uh, uh, Bangladesh and India, but uh, with growth averaging over uh, 7% uh, uh, in past consecutive five years. Uh, domestic demand in terms of consumption and investment has been strong. Major reforms and measures 
to make it easier to do business across South Asia have helped promote private investment. Uh, in next two years, for example, Bangladesh projected to grow by 8%, according to ADB uh, sources uh, recently published, among the relatively smaller economies of South Asia. Uh, economic performance has been more varied. Bhutan and Maldives grew by more than 6%, with Nepal uh, after Afghanistan grew a little below 5% on average from 2014 to 2018. And, and obviously, uh, you know, uh, Nepal could have done a lot better had there been no earthquake, let's say, you know, in 2015. But uh, sustained by domestic demand and public infrastructure spending, these three countries are set to grow at around 6.5% in next two years. That's a fantastic projection. And that's ADB saying, not us, individual government. I'd like to point out three basic strengths of the South Asian sub-region, which we need to be collectively capitalized for a better future tomorrow for our next generation, if not during our generation, at least. Uh, first, uh, uh, development vision, the government of uh, Bangladesh under the leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has undertaken a development vision to transform Bangladesh into uh, a developing country by 2021 and a developed country by 2041 and a prosperous delta by uh, 2100, which is 80 years from today. So we, we are really planning uh, long and in advance. Uh, our South Asian countries are implementing similar program. We know Bhutan's five years plan, Nepal's special drive to attract FDI. Uh, we need to formulate public policies and realign our resources, uh, no matter how limited that is, uh, so that the development vision could be implemented without much uh, hindrance. Uh, second, diversification of the economy. Uh, though Bangladesh has attained food self-sufficiency, it has succeeded to shift a significant chunk of surplus labor from agriculture to the service sector of the economy. And you know, that's what I meant by diversification of the economy. We have developed 100 special economic zones which render one-stop services to the investors. We have a very uh, liberal investment regime and our universities produce a vast pool of English speaking IT uh, literate graduates. Uh, and that's another, uh, uh, and our export in IT related uh, product and services has cost a, a billion dollar. And we have attracted companies like Samsung, you know, the latest, uh, uh, the, the phone, uh, the Samsung, uh, I think it's called S9 or S10, is being produced in Bangladesh now. Uh, we, have a very, uh, uh, we are also developing high-tech park, and this is where all these uh, manufacturers are going. Uh, the Bargoing uh, uh, IT sector is expected to offer employment opportunities in millions of youth who enter the job market around the year. Uh, such diversification is a common feature of the South Asian economies. I cited our example, but I'm sure our other colleagues would be citing their examples of, of similar nature. And we need to do more of that. Uh, in another uh, decade, we can expect a structural shift in most of the South Asian region, you know, coming out of this uh, age old or century dependency on textile, let's say, you know, these are the new features of our economic diversification. And thirdly, the huge internal market. Uh, and, you know, uh, we, we, we must not undermine our own strength, you know, our own uh, as we are empowering more uh, than uh, than ever before economically, their buying power is increasing. And this is an obvious advantage of South Asian economies. When I say every uh, one of the every four uh, citizens of this world is actually a South Asian. However, the region is yet to take full advantage of its uh, geographical uh, contiguity and togetherness. Uh, we lack that, we admit, and we are working towards that. Because of the huge internal demand, the region can remain relatively stable by its global economic and political setbacks and uncertainties. South Asia is also flanked by China and the ASEAN region, uh, we, with which the trade and investment ties are flourishing at the same time. Uh, continued annual growth of 7% uh, will double the size of South Asian economies in the next 10 years. And this is another good news if we continue to do things right. This will help significantly cut down poverty of more than 200 million people living below poverty line of $1.9 per, uh, per, uh, per day capita. Uh, to hold on to the momentum and remain the fastest growing sub-region of the world, uh, South Asian public and private institution must deliver better. Uh, it needs to continue economic reforms, maintain mac macroeconomic stability, and foster greater cooperation and integration among neighbors. Uh, despite encouraging signs, South Asia cannot uh, remain complacent at the same time. The, to retain growth, the regional countries have to implement pre-declared reform measures and launch a, a new wave of structural reforms, particularly in all factors of production, such as land, uh, labor, and capital. 
These are urgent in attracting investment and expanding the economy's economic base. Trade and investment regime uh, should encourage the economic agents to participate in global production and manufacturing networks, which is critical in elevating the region's economic standing at a time when global trading regime is turning increasingly competitive. Obviously, we're talking about our own region, but the other regions are not going to say sitting idle. You know, people are investing more in. Uh, in uh, in uh, Africa, uh, you know, economies in the Middle East are struggling, and they have money. They have uh, you know some uh, good uh, natural resources, and they are going to diversify as well. Um, I'd like to conclude uh, by this part by mentioning here that regional cooperation is one of the top foreign policy priorities of the government of Bangladesh, since we firmly believe that it is essential that all the countries of the region should develop uh, together for long-term stability and sustainable development of the entire region. Uh, to this end, from its earliest day, Bangladesh has uh, mooted that uh, we must focus on the uh, countries of South Asia, uh, sub-regionally as in BBIN, or regionally as in SARC. Or if you if we are failing in SARC, you know, we have BIMSTEC to fall back onto. And, you know, whether SARC uh, works or BIMSTEC works or you know, none of neither of them works. I mean, you know, we can countries can come together. I mean, you know, you have chosen the probably the right forum. You know, it's uh, it's uh, four or, or five of these countries are slow, so closely knit. Uh, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, you know almost uh, land borders with, with you know, we are connected with each other better than other mem other member of uh, the Sark family. And uh, and uh, whether that be Sark or Bimstek. Um, uh, all available synergies of these uh, these platforms uh, and vast potential of this region for mutual benefit. And I think we should work towards that. And we have uh, all the uh, commitment of the government and people are keen. And uh, we do have, uh, you know, uh, I didn't cover the historic linkages, but uh, it's not only that, but for our present and for future. And especially given uh, the fact that COVID-19 has almost destabilized uh, many uh, things that we actually uh, agreed to do, uh, I think we need to come even closer than ever before in our history. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Very eloquent uh, and very constructive contribution. Uh, indeed, uh, you've given a great sense of hope for South Asia. And uh, we. I wish to congratulate uh, Bangladesh for a wonderful, remarkable performance over the recent past both on the economic as well as on the social front. I mean, we take a lot of pride that there is a country which is truly moving forward. Now, allow me to uh, take the opportunity of introducing Honorable General B.K. Singh, Minister of State for Road, Transport and Highway, former Minister of State for External Affairs and Minister of State for Development of the Northeast Region from 2014 to 2019, former four-star general of the Indian Army and 23rd chief of the Army staff. Honorable sir, there is the question. And I'm going uh, based on the alphabetically, based on countries alphabetically. Economic prosperity, democratic, democratic government, free market economy, investors friendly, natural resources, diverse bias, biodiversity, ecological habitat. These are some characteristics of South Asian nations or the portfolios of one South Asia movement. We had always dreamt of making South Asia a model for development of 21st, 21st century. With powerful mass of young innovation, capital and resources, do we believe we can give this model to the world? Can India play the role of a coordinating coordination for economic upliftment, just like how Germany and France played role in EU and be able to gallop the 27 nation together as a regional player? Over to you, General Saab. Is General Singh there? I don't see. There seem to be some technical. He was there. Okay. In order to save time, while he comes back, let me let me proceed.
to our third honorable guest. Victor, can you check what is the problem? Indian. Allow me to introduce uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Maldives, Mr. Abdullah Sahid, an exceptional diplomat and politician who served in foreign ministry since 1983 as an officer, director, and as the executive secretary to the president. Appointed as the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of two, from 2005 to 2007 and appointed as a Minister of Foreign Affairs. President of the Association of the Shark Speakers. Honorable Minister, here goes my question. What regional integration can happen for tourism development? Coordination in economic development can resolve political differences, natural Cultural and religious diversities with young population in the region is the big mass force for the region. How shark should be how should shark be activated in such expansion and to enrich such a vision? Over to you, Honorable Minister. Good afternoon. It's indeed a great honor for me to be attending this uh, very distinguished panel. My special greetings to my dear colleague, the Minister for Affairs of Nepal, His Excellency Pradeep Kumar Diwali. Also to my dear friend and colleague, the Minister of State for Affairs of Bangladesh, His Excellency Shahya Alam. Also, to the distinguished Minister of State for Road and Transport and Highways of India, His Excellency Mr. Singh. Then a special greeting to you, Mr. Binod Chowdhury, uh, Chairman of Chowdhury Group, Co Global. I'm indeed indebted to you for this invitation to speak at this very important event. The COVID-19 pandemic has greatly impacted the entire world. Yet some countries are struggling more than the others because of their intrinsic vulnerabilities. Large countries, small countries, island countries, continental countries, we are all in this together. But together we are the suffering may be different. Imagine when you run into a storm, the waves are very high. For the larger vessels, they have to face the large waves. But when you are in the storm, the smaller vessels also run into the same large waves. The impact is different. And that is what is happening today facing this pandemic. Large populations living in poverty, congested conditions, lack of resources, weak and limited ability to rebound from external shocks and precarious dependence on a single industry for national income are some of the contributing factors. The countries of South Asia region possess one or several of these characteristics to varying degrees. Maldives is no exception. We have an over-reliance on a single industry, which is tourism, which places the Maldives amongst the most exposed and defenseless countries in the global economic crisis. Excellencies, dear friends, the Maldives... The Maldives responded quickly to the COVID-19 pandemic. A national health emergency was declared immediately. Our priority was to minimize our burden of our healthcare system. We boosted testing capacity, mobilized all available healthcare professionals, and put in place intensive precautionary measures. Despite this, we are finding the path to recovery extremely challenging. The reasons are many. With the closure of borders in March, our vibrant tourism sector came to 
a complete halt. The tourism sector accounts for more than 40% of the GDP and 76% of both direct and indirect contributions of the service industry. As a result, the government is facing a revenue gap of approximately 450 million US dollars and has taken strict measures to cut down on expenditure. Long-term plans for recovery from the crisis, including diversification of the country's economy, have been on the drawing board. The President is chairing a committee on the resilience and recovery of the Maldivian economy. However, we are facing huge challenges in coordinating this. We have opened our borders effective from 15 July 2020, and we are ready to welcome our international visitors. But the challenge here is that many of the markets from where we receive our large number of visitors have still not opened their borders, or they have very strict quarantine arrangements whereby a number of tourist arrivals to the Maldives have been limited. We need stronger partnerships that can help each other to recover better from this pandemic. The Maldives has always been a firm believer in regional cooperation, especially during times of adversity, such as the current global pandemic. In this context, we welcome the timely initiative by Prime Minister, His Excellency, Prime Minister of India, His Excellency Narendra Modi, to hold the video conference of SARC leaders in March. Maldives also appreciates the establishment of SARC COVID-19 emergency relief fund. I'm also pleased to note that several other important regional initiatives were launched to address the impacts of COVID-19 on the health sector, trade, finance, and economy. On the regional cooperation, I'm happy to recognize that the distinguished foreign minister of Nepal, under these very difficult circumstances, convened an informal meeting of the SARC foreign minister's meeting just last week. I believe that SARC can do much more to achieve its objectives of improving the lives of the peoples of South Asia. I look forward to hearing the views of the distinguished members of the panel and discuss these issues further. I thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Now I turn to my own uh, home country. Honorable Minister Pradeep Kumar Jawali, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Nepal. He is a former Minister of Culture, Tourism and Civil Aviation in two th from 2006 to 2007. Member of the State Affairs Committee of Parliament. Member of Parliament Proceeding Advisory Committee as a CA member from 2008 to 2012, member of the Standing Committee of Nepal Communist Party, and a passionate writer. It is remarkable how Honorable Minister Gewali is trying to take the SARC movement forward despite the stalemate that we see in the region. The recent meetings held in September initiated by the SARC Secretary General, bringing in all the finance minister and subsequent meeting pr promoted and hosted by Honorable G Minister Gewali are testimonials of this initiative. My question to Honorable Minister Gewali is that civil society has emerged as a powerful sector in shaping our state's politics and our economy. Our culture, religion, and social evolution is quite similar in all, in all our nations. How can we take the advantage of such common values and embark on regional integration at government level, business level, and as commoners? Do you think the civil societies are not engaged that much these days because of various political differences and political politics in hindering the way for such integration. Perhaps any such coherent policies are possible only when civil society, government and private sectors come together for a common good. 
What are the short term goals and long term goals in order for such integration? Over to you, Honorable Mr. Gewali. Thank you, Biruji. It's nice to meet even virtually to my dear colleagues, fellow ministers. Uh, Excellency Abdullah Said, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Maldives. Excellency Sariar Alam, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, Bangladesh. Excellency BK Singh, Minister of State for Road, Transport and Highway, India. Distinguished panelists and other participants. Good afternoon and namaste. I am pleased to attend this interactive discussion on the potentials for South Asia. At the outset, I would like to thank Oasis Global Visions Community for hosting this panel discussion on this important theme and giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts. Before I touch the question raised by uh, Moderator Binoji, I would like to highlight some of the potentials and the latest uh, developments in this region. Today, the whole world faces multifaceted impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, and South Asia is no exception. The pandemic tends to reverse our hard-earned development gains. It has already disrupted the lives and the livelihoods of our people. Millions have lost jobs. Millions are going to fall back into the poverty trap. The so-called second wave is also in the scene in South Asia. Our economies have heavily suffered. The public purse is getting slim day after day, and we face a huge capacity constraint. Let me briefly share the situation of COVID-19 in Nepal. We have seen altogether 77,870 cases and 498 deaths, which is 0.64%. Out of this, more than 56,000 people have already recovered, which is 70-5%, and there are some 20,000 active cases at present. The protection of lives of the people has been our top priority. We have launched the Healthy Nepal campaign to educate people to use traditional and herbal medicines, adopt healthy habits, and sincerely follow the safety measures of using masks, keeping social distancing, and maintaining hand hygiene. We have received support from our neighbors, including the SARC member states. Dear friends, our talk on the potentials of South Asia will be incomplete without talking about the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC. It was created in 1985 with the objectives of promoting people's welfare and improving their quality of life through accelerating economic growth and social progress. We, the SARC member states, have been working together to promote regional connectivity, trade, energy partnership, agriculture, and people-to-people -people contacts. Regional cooperation prominently features in Nepal's foreign policy. As the current chair and founding member, Nepal attests great importance to the SARC process. In its 35 years of operation, SARC has gained the necessary legal and institutional framework for the member states to mobilize it for achieving tangible results. The SARC process has uh, have moved ahead. It has taken some tempo too, but it has yet to deliver development dividends to the people. It is yet to serve as a vehicle for turning South Asia's potential to reality. The COVID-19 pandemic came with the compelling reason for the SARC leaders to sit together to chart out the ways and means to control the spread of the virus. Indian Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi hosted the SARC leaders' video conference on 15th March 2020. This injected hope in the region. Carrying forward the initiative of Prime Minister Modi, SARC health ministers met virtually in 23rd April, health officials on 26 March, and trade officials on 8th April 2020. A SARC COVID-19 emergency fund has been created. 
COVID-19 has forced us to find alternative ways to continue our interaction at bilateral, regional, and international level. We are gradually adapting to this new normal. This year, UN General Assembly has been taking place virtually. Nepal hosted the virtual informal meeting of the SARC Council of Ministers on 24th September 2020, which would normally be held in the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. Before that, we held the informal meeting of SARC Finance Ministers on 16th September 2020, which would be held on the sidelines of the annual meeting of Asian Development Bank. Nepal is going to host the virtual meeting of the SARC Education Ministers on 8th October 2020 to discuss the education sector's response to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. These meetings speak about the importance of regional cooperation to fight the common problems collectively and develop resilience at the regional level. Mr. Coordinator, now I would like to zoom on some of the most promising areas of cooperation under the SARC framework, which I believe are key to unleash the full potentials to South Asia. First is trade and commerce. Intra-regional trade in SARC stands just around 23 billion, which is far below its potential. We initiated SAFTA and SATIS processes. The SAFTA in 2004, envisioned our South Asian Economic Union. The CITES recognized the potentials for trade in services in the region. We have also put in place a number of trade facilitation agreements and measures under SARC with a view to supporting regional integration. Second is connectivity. Regional integration is not possible without connectivity infrastructures. The SARC member states initiated a discussion on the motor vehicle, railways, air services, and waterways connectivity. The initiatives for regional connectivity are underway and have not moved ahead to utilize these potentials. Connectivity is the top agenda in the BBIN sub-regional framework. Third is energy. SARC framework agreement for energy cooperation, electricity has also been signed in 2014. The energy sector is a key, key area for the region's development. South Asia is an emerging market. Power is the dr driver of the economy. The region has a huge potential for renewable and green energy. The energy cooperation is a top agenda under the BBIN sub-regional arrangements. Fourth, agriculture. This region is endowed with fertile land, diverse climatic conditions, appropriate for growing a variety of crops, food, grains, vegetables, fruits, herbs, and species. Fifth, people-to-people -people relation. Benazi, you rightly pointed out the role of the civil society and the uh, role of the business community. I fully agree with you, the role of those two. SARC is a home to over 1.8 billion people, the one-fifth of the humanity of the world. A large chunk of the population falls under the active age category with the young and youths. It has a huge demographic dividend and we should be able to expedite the people-to-people -people contracts, business community interactions, cooperation and collaboration, even in the difficult days uh, if there are some uh, misunderstanding in the political level. Civil society can play uh, a very robust role to strengthen uh, the regional cooperation. In so the South Asia region represents one of the great civilization. It is very rich in culture. It is blessed with the abundant natural and human resources. The region has high potentials for development. To date, such abundant resources remain either untapped or underutilized. The collective commitment of the SARC member states is vital to accelerate meaningful cooperation in areas of these potentials. The COVID-19 has hit hard the countries of South Asia. Already, the countries like Nepal have been facing poverty, unemployment, impacts of the climate change, natural disasters, and now COVID-19 comes to aid the, to the difficulty. Our GDP has already shrunken, markets significantly slow down, revenue base is narrowing. The coming days will test our individual capacity and measure the strength of regional partnership and resilience. Uh, resilience. 
we need to support each other in fighting COVID-19. It is equally important to ensure universal, easy and affordable access to vaccines and other health facilities once they are developed. We need to stand ready to face the difficult days ahead. It is also a time to put our honest efforts to unleash our potentials. The occasion calls us to rise above our conventional thinking. Thinkings. It is a time to utilize the frameworks and arrangements we have set up under SARC process. It is the time to remove barriers, diversify trade, and re-energize our economies. The problem we are facing today are so severe that no country can alone address those challenges. So it proves the relevancy of the regional cooperation. Again, I am quite confident that uh, the leaders of South Asia will take the serious initiatives to further strengthen and deepen uh, our regional cooperation so that we can achieve the long aspired regional, regional economic integration and the South Asian Economic Union. Thank you, Minerji. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Honorable Minister Jawali, for your very eloquent uh, contributions. Unfortunately, it seems that uh, the Minister of State uh, for India, General V.K. Singh, has not been able to connect back. He started off very well. We were about to uh, have the conversation with him going. Be it as it may, we have just about 12 minutes left. And I do know that this program has been televised globally through the Horasis Systems Global Network. Uh, I would like now to uh, raise a common issue, which probably uh, uh, can, could be addressed by all of you as a concluding statement, one by one. I wish to repeat that the time has brought us in a very strange stage. The perspective on globalization has a complete new set of definition in just about seven months' time. The COVID-19 crisis is an urgent call to action, moment to pursue innovative policies and jumpstart South Asian economies. As all of you pointed out, this was a region which was the fastest growing region. Sadly, it has not been, COVID has not spared us. So what is it that SARC as a collective region or some of us, let's say those who are present here can do collectively to make the pains of this situation less impactful and come up with some policies which will aspire people to do new innovations, new things and start new frontiers. Please, Minister Awad. Uh, thank you. It was uh, fascinating to listen from uh, my esteemed colleague, Honorable uh, Foreign Minister uh, of uh, Maldives and uh, Nepal, and hope that uh, we will be able to connect back to uh, uh, General Vike Singh, who knows the region very well, and knows the background, the history, and he is actually uh, very much part of uh, our history too, because during the War of Our Liberation, uh, he was uh, leading his troops, uh, Indian Army, uh, especially during the month of December, uh, in Chittagong region, and he speaks fluent uh, Bangla as well. So he's uh, considered them as one of us, and he is one of us, and India is one of us uh, in South Asia, of course. Uh, try and answer your question. I think uh, the impact uh, obviously uh, are, are varied. Uh, let's say. Because of kind of single or uh, our, our basket, our export basket or earning basket is not deep enough or wide enough. Uh, in case of Maldives, uh, Honorable Minister for Foreign Affairs very clearly mentioned uh, about uh, uh, struggle in the tourism industry. But I think uh, the other countries where diversification is not too bad, uh, even though it's very narrow. Uh, in our case, when the uh, lockdown in Europe and America started, uh, we were kind of at a loss because our 
uh, th one of the three major pillar of our economy is obviously one is domestic agriculture. The second is export earning led by government, which is, accounts for about 86% of our $40 billion export industry. And the third one is uh, the remittances that we receive from our nearly uh, 8 million workforce abroad. And uh, both of them were hit hard. Now to multiply that impact, uh, this year flooding, uh, I haven't seen many 1st of October in my life uh, in Dhaka or in northern Bangladesh where I'm from, Rajshahi, that it rains. Uh, we have had a uh, fifth phase of flooding in our rice bowl where, you know, we grow paddy in northern Bangladesh. Fifth round of flooding. Now, can you imagine if our policies, if our reserves or if the production in the previous year to the run up to this 2020, this, you know, very difficult year to put it politely, what would have been the impact? The impact as it is, is, is quite bad. But I think you need to kind of, un, it's difficult, foresee what's coming as much as possible and then invest immediately to make sure that you don't hit the bottom. Uh, the situation doesn't worsen any further. And I'll be appreciative highly to the stimulus packages announced as early as uh, first week of April by Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. And obviously that was possible because we were having good enough reserve uh, you know, it's touching about $40 billion mark, uh, you know, and uh, uh, surplus trade uh, because what happened is uh, people are obviously not buying as much as they used to. So the input is less. So we now have a current account surplus if you consider this particular couple of months. Uh, I would say that uh, it's varied, but we are still, com uh, you know, uh, in comparison to many other countries in the world, is kind of better off. But we need to learn better how to navigate and kind of duck and weave all these, uh, you know, falling rocks. Uh, but this will largely depend on how long it goes on uh, and uh, realign ourselves and kind of re -ad ad learn to adopt quickly. Uh, it's very important that our constituents, the countrymen, we have been through very difficult political phases, whether that be in Bangladesh or Nepal or even in Maldives. It's very important that our citizen realizes the difficulties of kind of running the government. I wish all of them did anyways, but, you know, but uh, there are forces uh, who works against uh, your pure objectives. So communicating with your countrymen is very important uh, and build better, you know, whatever specialization that we have. Uh, you know, I was wondering yesterday, sitting back home, that COVID situation, the rate of infection on, you know, percentage of deaths and things like that haven't changed drastically or dramatically in the last six months since March 7th when the uh, first March 8th, when the first COVID test uh, was detected, uh, first person uh, with COVID was detected. Now, what has changed is people's psyche. We are a little more confident. We know that, you know, youths and healthies are, are kind of uh, a little less vulnerable. Uh, the elderly and people with diabetic and heart diseases, pre medical you know, conditions are vulnerable. So, we have kind of learned or learning rather, I don't want to say we have learned, you know, that would be an exaggeration. We have kind of, uh, you know, uh, learning uh, to adopt with this uh, new, better normal for good. Uh, I think we need to have patience, uh, communicate with our constituents and countrymen better and deliver uh, whatever is essential with the reserves that we have because we sometimes we are hesitant to use up some of the reserves that we have created so you know under difficult circumstances with a lot of hard work and we don't want to let go of those reserves so quickly but i think this is the time uh, you know because unless you hold on and you know 
don't allow things to drop any further. Uh, you need to come up with uh, 